worship team, thank you for leading us tonight. I won't keep you long tonight. I'll just keep you till we get done. How's that? If you have your Bibles this evening, I'm just going to jump right into the Word. I'm excited about sharing with you this evening. But I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 3. And as you're turning there, I'm going to give you a passage of Scripture uh, to lead us up to that. I'm going to give you several passages tonight. I, I feel impressed of the Lord maybe to do a little teaching tonight, more so than preaching. But I pray that we will have ears to hear and a heart to receive tonight. Because where we find ourselves in this nation, and you've heard me say it on other occasions, but I think it needs to be said one more time and probably several more times afterwards, that as a nation we have never been this place before. The nations of the world has been here. We can read history and they have been here. And we can talk about dark days in our nation and some things that was not really times that we would celebrate in this nation in the last 200 years. But when it comes to the spiritual place that we find ourselves today, we have never been here. There has been moves of God, there's been outpourings of the Holy Spirit, and there's been evil, and there's been demonic opposition uh, from the kingdom of darkness, but we have never been here before. And with that being said, I believe it's very important that we have an understanding of where we are. And I want to try to lay that out tonight, And but if the Lord would help me, I want to try to teach us, we'll, we may start off teaching, but then I'll, I may preach for five minutes at the end. How's that? Just maybe to encourage you and get you excited before you leave, hopefully. Uh, but I want to talk to us tonight about spiritual authority. God has given every one of you in this room the ability to operate in spiritual authority. Meaning this, we do not have to wait for someone to come along to touch God for us. But we have the ability to move heaven and earth on our own behalf. And on behalf of others around us. And on behalf of this nation as well as the nations of the world. We do not have to settle. The reality is, is when we was born again, we was born again on a battlefield. And we have to realize that there is a real life struggle taking place today and we are able to bring about positive change in our lives as well as the life of others. But we have to realize that where we truly are, and I, I think it sums up very well in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read just a few verses there, and then I'm going to take us to Ephesians 3. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, troubled times. How many knows we're in that right now? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. How many knows all of those things are true? It's where we find ourselves right now. But notice the last phrase of verse 5. From such, turn away. We are in a place today, if we are not careful, we are forfeiting our spiritual authority that has been bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we are living lives of defeat and lack instead of abundance and blessing. And walking in a place where there can be growth and where there can be an abounding presence of God in this very hour. Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter 3, when you begin to read the book of Ephesians, we believe that the writer is Paul. We find that it was written while he was in prison. He was in Ephesus on his second and third missionary journey. 
And we find that the purpose of writing was to bring encouragement. It was to bring revelation knowledge to the church at Ephesus. And we believe it was written to circulate amongst the believers. But much like Galatians, as this was penned while he was in prison, it really was a two-part letter. First of it was simply, first half was simply to focus on right thought. And the other half was to consecrate on the practical Christian duties and constitute right actions, meaning what should we do and how should we do it. This message simply is a message that we have been freed from sin, but also how we are to live with that freedom. And when you start going through the book of Ephesus and you get to chapter number 3, I want to give you the first 10 verses of this chapter. And it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me for you. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore time in few words. Whereby when you read, you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul said, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Paul is writing and he simply is writing and penning. He's talking about revelation knowledge. And he's saying, because of the season that we're in, because of the dispensation that we're in, there has been things that has been revealed through Christ to this generation and the generations to come that has never been revealed before. And one of those things, if you flip over just a couple of more passages of Scripture and you go to chapter number 6 and verse number 10 through verse number 13, so it's a passage that most of you probably could quote, uh, if not completely, partially. He's writing, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. One of the things that was revealed to Paul and to the church at Ephesus, as well as every believer, is that there is a war that is going on, and it is a war between good and evil. And if we are going to stand tonight and say that there is a kingdom of light or there is a kingdom of God, then we have to stand and we have to also say that there is a kingdom of darkness. There is a kingdom that is not of light, not a blessing, not of prosperity, but there is a kingdom of destruction. And the Bible speaks very clearly about this kingdom of darkness and it is mentioned in multiple times throughout Scripture, and I want to take just a few moments and I want to bring it to light, so to speak, tonight, because the reality is what we're seeing played out in the streets of our city and in our political arena today in this nation is not just mere politics, nor is it just pure evil, but it is simply there is a moving and there is an intensity of the demonic that is moving in this nation like we have never known. And uh, I, I'm not one to really talk about the dark side of things. I'm usually a pretty optimistic individual. And, and uh, I'm not one of those guys that wants to act super spiritual and play with devils and all of those things. That's just not who I am. And, 
And the reality is, I believe it's very real, but I also believe that it is something that we have to be very serious in dealing with. And the reality is, <coughs> we have seen a lot of foolishness over the years when it comes to dealing with the kingdom of darkness. But I want to stand here tonight and tell you that the kingdom of darkness is really real. And it is really actively moving today in the midst of this nation. The reality is your sons and daughters, if they are in great school, junior high or high school, they are walking into demonic strongholds tomorrow morning where there is a moving of the demonic at a very escalated manner compared to what it was just 15, 20 years ago. We have our young adults that is in higher education facilities all across this nation that used to be operated and adhere to biblical foundational principles that was started as institutions of faith that has now been overran as is completely on the other side of the spectrum and our young adults are being indoctrinated at a rapid rate and it is very alarming. The things that we've saw played out on our television sets and social media device in the last 72 hours is, is very disturbing and while some may be propaganda, what is not propaganda is the lives of innocent people that was lost yesterday because of a kingdom of darkness that feels like it is no longer threatened and it can freely move in the open while the church is still sitting in the pews. I have to say tonight that that just makes me very uncomfortable and it makes me very infuriated inside because the reality is the audacity and, and the boldness of the enemy that we see in this hour cannot go unchecked, but it has to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with properly, but it has to be dealt with by the men and women of God. This is not a, a, a natural thing, but this is a spiritual thing. And tonight I want you to hear me that we are dealing with Satan's kingdom. It is referred to, the kingdom of darkness in Matthew chapter 12, 25 and 26 is referred to as Satan's kingdom. We also find that it is called the kingdom of darkness in Galatians 1 and 13. And we also know this, that the, the enemy has authority, but he has limited authority. But the reality is we have allowed portals to be opened from the heavenless where he now has access to come in and out as he wills because we are not using or utilizing our spiritual authority. If you go back to John chapter 12 and you begin to read in that chapter, you will find that when Jesus is getting ready to be betrayed and go to Pilate's Hall and go to, to Mount Calvary, and he says, Lord, uh, let your name be glorified. And the Lord responded from the heavenlies, and I preached that not too long ago, that it was simply, the, there was a voice that was heard and says, my name has been glorified, but yet it will be glorified again. And then he goes on to say, but today is a day where judgment is coming to the earth and that the prince of this world is going to be cast out. He's been thrown out. So we know that Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, he lost his domain, so to speak, on this earth. But we know that he is operating his kingdom out of the heavenlies. And we find that it is in the, and we read that in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 10, talking about that we read together tonight, that there is uh, some things in the heavenlies uh, that we can have understanding of uh, if we will apply ourselves to it and if we will seek the face of God and get into His Word. And we find that we know that after John chapter 12, that now Satan is referred to as the power of the air or the prince of the air. And we can read that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 2. There is a mention of that. It says, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. With that being said, we have to begin to look at who is the king of this kingdom, this dark kingdom, this kingdom of dark? Who's really in control of it? And when you begin to look through Scripture, you find that he is giving many different titles, but he is uh, the one and the same. And one name that you will find throughout Scripture is he's referred to as Satan, We've meaning this, that he is an adversary. How many knows that there is opposition today to the things of God? And we find that that opposition is always birthed uh, through the adversary or through Satan himself. Uh, you can read of that in Job 
Job chapter 1, verse number 6, verse number 12. Also, you can read that in Job chapter 2. But if you go a little further, we find that he is also referred to as the devil, meaning this, that he is the accuser of the brethren. And therefore, we must realize that it is the one that is the devil himself that is always accusing or making accusations uh, against the body of Christ. And then we find that his other title is he's referred to as a serpent, meaning he's a beginner. He's one that is always trying to connive. He's always trying to, to bring and sow discord and, and uncertainty. And, and he's also referred to as a dragon. We find that he is meaning this, that he is an enchanting serpent. I mean, he, he adores himself in a manner where he begins to entice people and he begins to make people become curious about who he is and what he is and well maybe that's really not that bad or well maybe just I need to expose that and just try that just for a moment and we find that those that have had an encounter with the dragon in their life they if they've survived and they have really had an encounter with God after the fact they will simply say I just wanted to see what it was one time but it got its claws into them in such a manner that they could not get free from it. And therefore, it is a very dangerous encounter for all of humanity. We also know that he is given the title of the angel of light, meaning this, that he is a master of deception. He is a deceiver. And we find that he is one that is very good at what he does. Let's just be honest and real because we know that there is men and women that sit in the house of God for year after year and they still was brought into a place of trickery because he presented himself as an angel of light. And we find that he has a title called Lucifer, meaning this, that he is the morning star. He brings an illuminating light into situations that entice people to believe that there is hope or there is escape in him. But we also find that he has a title where he is addressed as a murderer. And we find that simply means that he is the killer. He is the one that will kill your vision. He will kill your dream. He will kill everything that you are. And it is his duty and his responsibility, so to speak, that he believes in that I have to steal, kill, and destroy from everyone. But Satan's activities simply always correspond to his names, meaning this, that he lives out these evil roles in the lives of men and women when he is given the opportunity. But not only just in men and women, but if he is given a welcome mat, so to speak, in a nation, in a city, in a state, he then begins to operate in all of these titles that I just gave you. And he can do that at multiple times in multiple fashions, meaning this, that he begins to actively engage uh, the kingdom of darkness in a city, in a nation, in a state, or even in a family. We, we don't really have a whole lot of information about Satan's origin other than we have a prophetic insight that is given to us by Isaiah and by Ezekiel as well as Jesus. And we know this, that he was in the heavenlies. We know that he was the one that was very instrumental in leading worship. We know that he was someone that was entrusted uh, uh, with great responsibility. And we know that there was something that began to happen in his life and he began to be one that was lifted up with pride in Isaiah 14 and 12. And we find that as he began to be lifted up with pride, he began to desire to be exalted above God himself. And he wanted others to begin to bow down to him like they was bowing down to our father. And we find that he becomes the first sinner according to Ezekiel 28 and 15. And we also know that he becomes the first liar in John chapter 8 and verse 44. Why is these things as important is because the simple fact is that when you become lifted up in pride, it begins to take you into a place of sinfulness and it takes you into a place where now the truth becomes distorted in your life. And we find that upon his pride and upon his failure, he began to have such a grip or such an enticing about him that 
Revelations 12 and 4 tells us that one third of the angels of heaven followed Satan in his rebellion against God. And we find that in this time of rebellion, that it shows that they was cast out of heaven. And these titles show us that there is different ranks because we know that there was different ranks or different angels that was mentioned and talked about as they was cast out. We find that as this began to be a process that some of these angels we know now are already reserved in a special compartment in hell to be released at a later date. We read of that in 2 Peter 2 and 4, I believe it is. But we also know this, uh, that there begins to be subjects in this kingdom and not all angels are bound in, 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 in a chamber, but there is angels moving on behalf of this kingdom of darkness even today that is helping Satan or Lucifer, whatever you want to call him tonight, fulfill his plan upon humanity. But not only is the subjects of his kingdom fallen angels, but there is demon spirits. We don't have a lot to go on when it comes about the origin of demons, but however, there is much information in Scripture about them. And we can begin to gain great knowledge through their activities when we look at it through Scripture. We know this first of all, that demons, they are spirit beings, Matthew 8 and 16. We know that they have personalities according to Luke chapter 4, 33 and 35. We also know that they are numerous. In Mark chapter 5, verse number 9, it says we are legion, meaning this is that we are thousands, meaning this, we are not a small number, but we are mighty. And meaning this, that we're all lock and step together. We're not divided, but we're, we're all going forward for the same common goal. We are in unison about bringing destruction and death to humanity. The Bible does not really go much further than that other than when you start walking through Mark chapter 5, you begin to see many insights of what it really goes on in the demonic world. And just stay with me, we're going somewhere this evening. We find that in the, when you get an insight of the demonic world, you begin to find this. I want to give you a list of things that you find about demons. Number one is this, demons are impure in chapter 5 verse number 2. We also know this, that demons always identify with death. We also know that demons are powerful. We also know that they are tormentors. We also know that they are intelligent. We also know that they are rulers. And we also know this, that they desire a home. They desire a place to live. And we also know this, that demons always desire to destroy the place that they inhabit. They never want to leave it alone when it comes to humanity because we must never forget that humanity was made in the likeness and the image of God. And there is such hatred and there is such a... Uh, such desire to destroy that which they once saw and therefore when they see you and I they don't necessarily see us uh, but they see the image of God that we are created in and therefore they want to come in and disrupt and destroy. What is the activity of these demons? We know this. Demons always come and they seduce and they deceive. First Timothy chapter 4 verse number 1 tells us that now the Spirit is speaking expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We are right now in this nation dealing with a generation that does not know God nor the things of God, but at the same time we're dealing with that, we are dealing with a generation of believers in the house of God that's there every Sunday morning that are being deceived and seduced uh, by demonic influences because now we're no longer taking our Bibles to the platform. We're no longer talking about the crucifixion. We're no longer talking about the blood. We're no longer talking about eternity because the reality is we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to disrupt anything. But the reality is uh, we are selling ourselves to the devil every day because because the reality is uh, we are now buying into the lies of the enemy that we don't have to live holy. We don't have to live separated. Uh, we don't have to be the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, but I'm going to stand here tonight and tell you if you want to play with the world, you're going to die and go to hell. The reality is tonight that there is a seducing spirit uh, that is telling men and women of faith that you can still tip the bottle and make it to heaven. Uh, you can still sleep around and make it to heaven. Uh, you can still do all of this stuff and make it to heaven. But the reality 
reality is you're not going to do it because it is a seducing, deceiving spirit. Uh, it is Satan has released that on the earth today uh, and says you can go in and sit down with them, uh, whisper in their ear, press them every day, just like Delilah did to Samson. Tell me your heart. Tell me your heart. Tell me your heart. Uh, and we hear it and we're getting wore down day after day after day. Uh, and then we begin to cave. And the reality is the demonic world is making great influence uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, and then we have leaders that say, well, it really ain't that bad, sweetie. Uh, listen, uh, we're dealing with life for eternity. Uh, we're talking about hell uh, and we're talking about heaven. Uh, we're talking about a bottomless pit uh, where when you're cast out, you're going to fall continually, uh, where there is gnashing of teeth, uh, where there is complete, uh, utter torment uh, and the enemy wants every one of us to end up there uh, but I come tonight to tell you uh, that there is spiritual authority that is given uh, to the men and women of God uh, and we don't have to settle for defeat uh, but we can rise up and raise a standard up against the enemy uh, but uh, hear me today uh, we got to become aware of what God has entrusted with us I'm going to preach tonight while you sit there and just forgive me you must understand, understand the activity of demons. Not only do they seduce uh, and deceive, uh, but they always fight the gospel. Notice with me Matthew chapter 13, verse number 19. We read these words. It's the parable of the seeds that has been sown. And it says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Here's what's happening today. The word of the Lord has been presented. But if we're not careful, it's not been protected. It's not been guarded. And the demonic forces of hell are coming in and grabbing that seed right after it has been put down and it is a generation is left without hope and without peace and without rest because somebody planted it but now it's gone and somebody planted it and now it's gone and it, it just it, it's never getting an opportunity because hear me today the kingdom of darkness is experiencing something in in, in the heavenlies that we don't see in the natural but it is moving and it's happening every moment and that is this there is a realignment of the angelic beings of heaven. And the realignment is the setting of the stage for the return of the Lord to come for His bride. And the demonic forces of hell are beginning to see the realignment of God's army. And because of that, he realizes that my days are numbered, my time is limited, and therefore we have to work continually and strategically. And therefore, that is why we're seeing such the activity that we're seeing today is as the word goes forth, but it seems like it's not producing fruit, is because there's a moving of the demonic that the moment that the word is released is the moment the demon comes through and grabs the seed and says, I'm not going to let it stay there. That is the job of the demonic. We know this, that the activity of demons also, they oppress people. Acts chapter 10, verse number 38. It shows a very clear picture. It says how God had anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. How many knows that there is an oppressing spirit today in this land? But if you notice, that oppressing spirit isn't just affecting those that is in the world, but it is affecting those that's in the house of God faithfully. There is an oppressing. He's trying to push on them and push on them. And, 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 and he's simply saying, if I can just wear them down, then, then they're not going to be able to really resist me or fight against me. We find in Scripture when Jesus was in the synagogue teaching and he saw that the daughter of Abraham had been in a particular manner for about 18 years. She was bowed over. It was, simply an, it was not necessarily a physical sickness, but it was a spiritual sickness. She had been oppressed by the enemy for 18 years. And she was a believer or he would have never called her a daughter of Abraham. But as she was oppressed by the enemy, it, it had pushed her over in such a way for 18 years. This is how she walked around. She could not see anything in front of her because of what was oppressing her. 
there is a lack of excitement. There's a lack of joy. There's a, there's a lack of enthusiasm in the body of Christ if we're not careful today. is because we have allowed the enemy to oppress us in such a way that we can't see what God has in store for us. But demons also don't just oppress, but they also possess. We know that a Christian is not able to be possessed because the temple of God cannot be inhabited by a demonic thing. While people of faith can be oppressed, they can never be possessed. But how many knows that when someone is living outside the covering of God, that possession is a real thing? Pastor Phil shared a story with some of you probably while he was sitting eating with you this week about an individual that they encountered even in China last week that had possession. And it was real. Reality. But the very next day after they prayed for that individual, that lady was in the house of God worshiping the Lord because there was release that came. You see, you and I today must understand that if there is a kingdom of darkness and if there is subjects in that kingdom such as fallen angels and demons, then there is a territory where those subjects operate in. And we know that they operate in realms that is open to them. Now, this may make some of you a little uncomfortable and maybe I'm getting a little too nosy, but the reality is you must be very careful what you allow in your house. You must be very careful about what you allow to come into your eye gate and your ear gate because you may think it's innocent and fun, but the reality is when you start allowing the world to come in through your eyes or through your ears, guess what? You are allowing the demonic forces to come in and take habitation into your house. I appreciate the technology of our day. But one of the craziest things that I see taking place today is mommies and daddies and even grandmas and grandpas giving this to a generation with no boundaries, no security, and say, just do it. Just stay out of my way. Just do it. The reality is while they're sitting in your home where you have Jesus praying and even the word been preached, the devil is sitting there because you have left gates open all around you and you've got them sitting there and they're just watching and they're listening. Listen, I, I know this isn't popular, but I'm going to be honest and real with you. There's innocent fun, and then there's some fun that's not so innocent. Innocent fun no longer becomes innocent when you begin to mingle with the world and say, well, it's not really that big of a deal. It is a big deal. There are certain things that should never be played in your house. There should be certain things that should never be played in your car as a man of God, as a woman of God. There are certain things you should never open yourself up to because you never know what the enemy is devising, uh, what kind of plan he's plotting to get into your life or to get into your family because the reality is you just have to hear one thing in a certain time or a certain frame and then it's boom, he's got you. Hear me today, it's real. Read the story of Johnny Cash. Just one man you can talk about. The young ones don't know who Johnny Cash is. The older ones, you know who he is. He was the man back in the day. That was before they had the ability to fly like they do in airplanes and everything else. But when he was really getting started and big, one of the guys that was in his band handed him a little bitty pill and said, Here, Johnny, this will help you. And for the next 35, 40 years, he chased that feeling because it haunted him all of those days. And late in life, he shares his story. It was just that one time, just that one thing. And it was like, oh, it got him. What was it? In the form of that little bitty pill, it was a demon spirit that grabbed a hold of him and destroyed his life for nearly 40 years. Tonight, if we're not careful... Under the umbrella, oh, it's really not that big of a deal. We're losing a generation. Because this is a generation that wants something that's authentic and real. They don't want a story. But they want to see something that's authentic and real. Because the reality is the world that they're living in and been exposed to is real. And it is authentic. And it is full of power. 
It's full of ability to seduce, to deceive, and to oppress, and yes, even possess. What should our attitude be as believers towards these things? Here's the reality. We must realize that we are in the kingdom of light, not the kingdom of darkness. And allow me to say this, light will always cancel out darkness. If you walk into any room that is completely dark and you flip on a light switch, you dispel darkness in a moment. Because light always overpowers darkness. The moment that you become born again, the moment that you become a child of God, the moment that she was birthed into the kingdom of light is the moment that she was given the power and the ability to dispel darkness. You don't have to wait 15 years, 30 years. You don't have to pray three hours a day, all of those things. Listen, all those things are wonderful. And we should grow in our faith and we should get to a place where we move in the spirit at a greater level than we ever has as we continue to grow. But the moment that you was born again is the moment that God gave you the power and the ability to resist the devil. And scripture says what he has to flee from you. Why is it then that we as born again believers sit and allow darkness to dominate our culture, our society, our nation, and our families? It's because of the simple fact tonight, if we're not careful, we do not know the spiritual authority that we have. We must also realize that Jesus has given us authority. Mark chapter number 16. If you was to go to that chapter, you would read these in verse number 15 through 18. He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But verse number 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. What those 17 and 18 simply saying is this, is when you realize that Jesus has given you the authority to cancel out darkness, then you are able to operate in a manner where you can be world changers. And it doesn't matter what subjects the enemy brings into your realm, they do not have the ability or the power to overthrow you or to disrupt you, but you have the ability to overpower them because you have been given authority through Jesus Christ. If you go a little further, you find these words. We have to realize that the devil will always try to bring attacks against you. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 makes it very clear that he is always looking for someone to attack. But how many knows that if we stand guard, he does not have the right or the ability to do so? You say, I wish it was different in my family. I wish it was different in my home. I wish that things would take a different turn. They will never take a turn until you begin to activate and operate in the spiritual authority that God has given you. I'm not talking about name it and claim it stuff, but I'm talking about being rooted in the Word of God and standing steadfast. As I mentioned this morning, when David looked at everything that was going on in Psalms 57, and he said this, my heart is fixed, O Lord, my heart is fixed. When you get to a place where you know who you are in Christ and you say, nothing will move me, but I will stand. It changes the dynamics of everything in our life. We also must realize that there is a place where Satan cannot touch you. How many of you like to say, man, I like to get where Satan can't touch me? You're in that place. You have that place. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 18. Let me read it to you. It says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. When I am in the shelter of the arms of the Almighty, he can come, he can huff, he can puff, he can threaten to blow the house down, he can threaten to do all of these things, but when I am in Christ, he does not have the ability. When you look at the story of Job, the Lord said, have you considered my servant, Job, who is a 
Jesse is an upright man. He's perfect. And he said, well, if you let me touch everything that he has, you know. And he said, you can touch everything, but you can't touch his life. Take everything, but you can't touch his life. Listen, there's times when things that we love will be touched, but there our life cannot be touched. When we are with God, listen, we don't have to worry. We don't have to sit and wring our hands. I've been in this thing long enough now. And I don't say this in a proud fashion or a boastful fashion, but there's been a few times that, that my heart has skipped a beat when I've been in certain places around the world and, and those types of things. But I can stand before you today and tell you that there is no reservation in my life right now to go wherever he says go. And it's not because I think I'm super strong or super smart because you all know me and you know none of those things are true. But the reality is I've just willingly giving myself the best way that I know how to say, God, I'm trusting you. And when the enemy has plotted against me at home, here in this land, as well as other lands, the Holy Spirit of God has always showed up as my protector and said, you can't touch his life. Because there's a place that we can dwell, and it's in Christ, where we cannot be touched. Why? Because we have been given spiritual authority. I want to leave you with this tonight. There is weapons that has been given to you and I as men and women of faith that we are to use, not occasionally, but continually, to combat and to destroy the invasion of the kingdom of darkness in our life, in our community, in our families, and in our nation. And I want to give them to you tonight very quickly. Number one is this. One of the greatest weapons that has ever been given to humanity is the Word of God. If you do not have this instilled in your life, you have no ability to fight off the kingdom of darkness. You can come to the house of God every Sunday. You can shout across the front of this building or any other building. You can dance down the aisles. You can lift your hands. You can cry. You can weep in His presence. But if you do not possess this in your life, you do not have the ability to fight off the kingdom of darkness. I'm not saying you have to quote it word for word. But I'm saying that there should be enough word in you that the word should rise up in you and you should be able to offer a scripture offering to God at a moment's notice and you should do it continually throughout your day. Those of you that have had the privilege to watch the documentary The Insanity of God, you will probably remember the man in Russia that was in prison for 17 years because of his faith. And every time he found a little piece of paper or a little piece of broken pencil, he would write from memory scripture verses that he knew. And he would take that and he would reach as high as he could on that old cement wall and he'd plastic it there and he would make it an offering to God. I want to ask you this evening just to get in your stuff and make you uncomfortable. When was the last time you gave a scripture offering to God? See, if there is no word been professed out of your house, out of your life, that means this, there is no line of defense against the enemy. Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if stuff's going bad in your house, you just take and start writing scripture, put it on the refrigerator, put it on the bathroom mirror, put it over every door, do whatever you got to do because when the scripture has been lifted up, when the word of God has been declared and proclaimed, that means this, it's almost like a bloodline around it and the enemy says, I can't go there because there is spiritual authority in operation and I don't have access there kind of funny that he can freely come in and out of the churches across America every Sunday morning with no opposition, isn't it? Kind of funny that people that come bound leave bound. People that come sick leave sick. People that come possessed leave possessed. People that come oppressed leave oppressed. Is it possible, just possible that there needs to be a little bit more word in our life? Just asking. 
I can just say this, that there's been times in my life where I didn't have the energy, I didn't have the intellect, I didn't have the strength to do anything other than just kind of offer up a little bit of the Word, and all of a sudden all, there was just a rushing of the Spirit of God. Listen, my friend. As a believer, if you're going to combat the kingdom of darkness, if you're going to keep your family safe, if you're going to keep your children safe, you're going to have to use the Word of God. And you cannot use it if you're not familiar with it. Remember the story of David? They put Saul's armor all on him and says, okay, go fight him if you want to. And he looks around and moves around and he says, I, I'm sorry. I know this is the king's armor. I know all of the stuff. I know this is the best of the best. But you know what? I've never, I've never proved them. I, I can't go in this because I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I've never operated in this before. So what did he do? He went out onto the battlefield and he faced Goliath. And he said this, you come to me with a, with, with a sword and a spear. But he said, I come to you what? In the name of the Lord. In the word of the Lord. I come to you because he said, I've operated in this before. You see, those that was before us, they experience an outpouring of God in their lives and in their communities and in this nation because of the simple fact that they was not intimidated to use the Word of God. If we're going to drive back darkness, we're going to have to use the Word. Secondly, tonight is this. We find that we have to use this weapon. It's not a popular weapon, but it is one of the greatest tools in our tool chest that has ever been given to us, and that is the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 16, verse number 17, we read just a moment ago, but he simply said, in my name. He didn't say in anybody else's name, but he said, in my name. Hear me today. The only way that we can effectively, effectively drive back the force of darkness it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. How do they do that? In the name of Jesus. Right now, you are going to have to begin to understand the power in the name of Jesus. You know what needs to be proclaimed over this nation right now? It's not my opinion. It's not my conservative values. It's not about this party, that party, but it's about somebody standing up and saying, you know what, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus. Now, I know that may seem bold and that may seem like a, like, like a touche and it's like, oh, well, I don't know if that, that's really... No, listen, hear me today. When the church will stand and say, in the name of Jesus, I command and I take authority... You see, we're playing and we're fighting with things in the natural, trying to make things happen, trying to make things different. But listen, when you can stand and you know that you're in Christ and the Word is in you and you're in Him, you can stand and say, in the name of Jesus. Why? It's because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess because He is what? He is Lord. He is the ultimate authority of this universe and of every universe. The reality is there is no higher power, no greater power than Him. There's no name above His name because He is the highest that there is. And when we proclaim the name of Jesus, that means everything is subject to that name. When we began to deal with cancer, it is in the name of Jesus. When we began to deal with heart disease, it's in the name of Jesus. When we began to deal with the civil unrest in this nation, we began to do it in the name of Jesus. There has to be a calm. Thirdly is this. As a believer, we have not just any spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit that is within us. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4. It says, You are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. The only way that we're able to walk in victory is because of that which is in us. And it's not just any spirit, but it's the Holy Spirit. And we today must realize that we have to activate that. We have, and that's why Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gifts that is inside of you. What he's really saying is stir up the Spirit, the, that Holy Spirit. Stir up that which is inside of you because there is nothing greater, there is nothing more powerful than that which lives and dwells inside of you. And fourthly, not only is the Holy Spirit within us, but we find that there is the gifts of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 10, begins to lay it out that there is different operations, but there is the same Spirit. The dunamis power of the Holy Spirit simply refers to the released authority 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest verses of all times, in my opinion, in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 10, is simply that which I quoted just a moment ago, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Notice with me. Of things in the heaven, the realm of His kingdom, the realm of the kingdom of darkness in the heaven, things on earth, that means men that think that they are untouchable and that have all power. And then those things that's under the earth, which is he referring to the angels that's already in captivity and the demonic things that's under the earth already. They too have to bow at the name of Jesus. So what happens is, whether it be orchestrated from the heavenly realm, or whether it be moving in the earthly realm, or whether it's been birthed from underneath the earth, when you begin to decree and declare the Word of God, the name of Jesus, and you begin to activate the Holy Spirit that's inside of you, and you operate in the giftings of the Holy Spirit that we have been endued with, we begin to silence the enemy. And the enemy, notice this, has to back up in retreat and bow in our presence because of the spiritual authority that's been given. That's why we see multiple times in Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, concerning the children of Israel, the Lord would say something like this. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because this battle's not yours, but I'm going to fight for you today. What he was saying is this, I'm going to use my authority and I am going to push back, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to dispel the kingdom of darkness and you are going to see a way where there was no way. But now you fast forward to present day and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that quickens this mortal body. So my question is, why are we not seeing revival? As they come to the music tonight. My question is, why are we not seeing our children delivered? The question is, why are we seeing a generation go to their death prematurely? Why is it that we see gross darkness increasing? Why is it that we see inroads of this kingdom of darkness that's now not just attacking our 25-year-old or our 15-year-old, but now is attacking our 5-year-olds? I can display it probably better than I can say it. But what we're guilty of today in America as the church is we found our chair of leisure. We found our chair of pleasure. And we've said, don't bother me. I don't have time for it. I don't, I don't want to be disrupted by it. We've allowed the gates of our cities to be burned and our walls tore down. And darkness is growing all around us. We have a generation that thinks they don't have to be separated. They don't have to be holy. They don't have to be righteous. We have a generation that looks at guys like me and says he's too old-fashioned. He's not relevant anymore. Can you believe that? At 45 years old, I'm too old. By the modern standard of the church, I'm too old to pastor. I'm too old to be a voice. If you're not 30, don't have time for you. We got children dying and going to hell. And it's not children that Mommies and daddies are strung out on cocaine or heroin, but it's mommies and daddies that's singing in the choir. Mommies and daddies are going to have to give account before God because they didn't resist and they didn't contend. Can I be real with you tonight? If you're really going to be a man of God, if you're really going to be a woman of God, you hear your pastor. You're not going to be the most popular parent at high school or junior high or grade school.
But if you're really a man of God, a woman of God, you're going to be peculiar. You're going to be misunderstood. They may even snicker and laugh at you. But I'd rather them laugh at me. I'd rather them know that I love them and tell them the truth. Because there's a kingdom of darkness that does not have the right or the ability to do what it's doing. But we're allowing it. We can't get up and go to the house of God or we can't go up and close somebody or we can't feed somebody because it's too inconvenient for us. As I mentioned this morning, there's a 15-year-old girl that's been abused and God only knows what's going on with her in the last few months. But her life's in the balance right now in Nigeria because she won't deny her faith. And they said, we're going to kill you if you don't deny Christ. She says, kill me. Somebody didn't shake my hand, so I'm not going back to that church. I was persecuted. That's the mindset of the American Christian. We have strayed so far. Revival won't just happen, my friend. It's not just going to blow in. And our city isn't going to just going to begin to burn with passion. No. Sorry. Somebody's got to stand and take the word. Somebody's got to stand and proclaim Jesus. Somebody's got to dare to be different enough that yes, they even began to have a prayer language again. Where the Holy Spirit of God begins to be in operation in our lives in such a way where we don't look at our watch five minutes after we get on our knees, but we find ourselves there five hours later. You have spiritual authority tonight. But if it's lying dormant, if it's not actively been moved and used, Somebody's going to bury their baby in the morning. Didn't have to. Somebody's going to get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning that we found Johnny. And it was just one time too many. Or a 13-year-old girl's going to have to walk in and sit down in front of her dad and her mom tomorrow. It's in church today, though. You're going to have to walk in and say, I don't, I don't know what happened, but the baby's going to have a baby. Because, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, it's, it's all innocent. Oh, it'll be all right. No. Won't be all right. I'm really trying to quit, but I just can't. God, to help us to proclaim the word of God in this nation again. God, to help us not be so intimidated that we won't say the name of Jesus again. God help us to just be bold enough to reach down and to stir up that spirit one more time and see what happens. My prayer is for kingdom of darkness to experience one of the most devastating blows that it's ever experienced in this nation. The reality is it can and it will 
if we just be brave enough to proclaim the name that's above every name one more time. And if we dare to be different, say, I'm not going to settle for the status quo. We got men and women of faith that'll arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning to go to a Trump rally because he's their man. But if it's a little bit of a sprinkle, they can't come to the house of God. We'll go to our favorite football game and we'll get there three hours early. Comes to the house of God, we come unprepared, unready. We come running in, saying, God, do it in an hour and a half. Can't do it. All of the while, Satan, fallen angels and the demonic spirits are sitting and laughing and having their heyday and say, this isn't even any opposition anymore. We just come in and we have our will and our way in their life. We've got them so in bondage. we got them so in disarray. They don't even know. Nobody's going to blow on you to make it happen. Nobody's going to bring it to and hand it to you. As men and women of faith, we got a desire. We got a desire more. We got to desire the things of God. How many has to die before we say it's enough? How many has to be destroyed before we say it's enough? How many more innocent lives has got to be taken before we say we'll get involved? Tonight I'm calling you. I wish I could call the nation, but the nation's not here. It's just you. I'm sorry. I'm calling you to be men and women of God. I'm calling you to come to a place where nothing else matters and you say, you know what? If need be, I'll lay down my life. Because this is real. Somebody's daughter right now somebody's son right now as I'm speaking to you has been overwhelmed and overran by the demonic forces of hell and we have the ability to change it but will we are we concerned enough if we're not careful we'll walk from this house tonight like every other believer in this nation go home we'll warm us up a piece of cold pizza or we'll get us a bowl of ice cream we'll sit down in our recliner and we'll unwind then we'll go and we'll lay down on our bed we'll set our alarm we'll close our eyes and we won't lose any sleep but can I tell you tonight while we're sleeping the kingdom of darkness isn't sleeping and he's moving and he's plotting He's doing everything in His power and His ability to get to your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, your sons, your daughters. He says, I want to destroy them. I want to overrun them. And if we're not decreeing the Word, if we're not using the name of Jesus, and we're not operating in the Spirit, there is no resistance to it. There's no opposition to it. And he moves freely, uninterrupted. But tonight, if we'd say no more, if we'd say not on my watch, oh, I know we come together and pray in times and know the thing that's all wonderful, but what would happen? What would happen if the church in America tonight would say, today is the day, it's all changing from today, but from this day forward, This house will never be without the sound of prayer in it again. This house will never be without the sound of worship again. You say, now you're becoming radical, preacher. Yes, I am.
because that's what it's going to require. Somebody say, what's wrong with you, Pastor? What's wrong with me is I'm tired of seeing people die. All of our hope tonight has got to be in Him. As we stand all over the house tonight.